Um, Your Honour, just prior to resuming uh, the examination of Mr. Spinks, um, if I might take the opportunity to say something about <coughs> Mr. Jeffrey Jackson, who's a member of the governing body and who's currently in Australia. That's some... the governing body in New York. That's right. So some weeks ago it came to the attention uh, of the Royal Commission that Mr. Jackson, a member of the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses in, in New York, was in Australia. We wrote to the lawyers acting for the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia uh, and asked if their client would procure a statement from Mr. Jackson and make him available as a witness. The reply that was received was that Mr. Jackson was in Australia for private, compassionate reasons and also that since the governing body was not involved in the implementation and administration of policies and procedures in re relation to child sexual abuse, he would not be able to give relevant evidence. The Commission, the Royal Commission, then left the matter at that <coughs> point, but subsequently came to the view that Mr. Jackson's evidence would likely be useful for this hearing, particularly in relation to the formulation of policies and procedures by the governing body and the possibility for change of policies and procedures in the future. We therefore wrote last week asking whether the lawyers for the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia would accept service of a summons on Mr. Jackson. The reply that was received reiterated that for reasons of compassion related to why Mr. Jackson was in the country, it would, as it was put, be unconscionable for him to be required to prepare to give evidence and to give evidence. Taking that into account, Mr. Jackson has not been summoned to give evidence. We would, however, welcome evidence from him or another member of the governing body, particularly with regard to the setting of policies and procedures and the possibilities for change of those policies and procedures, and the door is open for the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia or the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Australia to present such evidence for this hearing, uh, including by video conference. Uh, gentlemen, I don't know which of you two should respond to that, um, but can I make it plain that if it's not plain already, that the Commissioner and I have uh, concern about the process of investigation uh, and determination of allegations within the Jehovah's Witness and whether it's a uh, safe and effective process um, for the determination of an allegation by a person that they have been sexually uh, abused by someone within the church. Now, I understand the um, theocratic foundation for the present position, or at least I think I do, um, but um, at the moment we do not have um, a witness, as I understand it, who can tell us what the way forward might be to enable the church to bring its processes into a... Uh, uh, to, to bring its processes to the point where rather than run the risk of uh, increasing the trauma on those who have been abused, the processes can assist in alleviating the trauma. Um, it is of fundamental importance to people who have been abused that when they go to the relevant authorities, and in this case it is the church because the church demands a complaint be brought to the church, but it's of a fundamental importance to people who are abused that when they go to the relevant authority, their story is accepted and they have the opportunity to um, tell the whole of their story to a forum which they can have trust in and which will enable them then to pass, as it were, uh, some of the burden to that institution which requires in this case, uh, that it report, or that person report. Now, these are very significant issues. They're not small issues, they're significant issues. Um, and at the moment, we're, as I say, facing a situation where we can see a problem, but we do need assistance from the church in what is the solution. And we rather thought that uh, Mr Jackson might be able to assist us 
in that respect. I understand the reason for compassion being extended to him. I have no difficulty with that. Um, and for that reason, I have not issued a summons requiring him to attend. But at the moment, we face a serious issue which only the church can help us with. Now, whether that needs a response now, I don't know, but we would like you to reflect upon that situation. Yes, Mr Stewart. Uh, Your Honour, may, may I respond on, on behalf of the um, persons I represent? Um, the, uh, what Your Honour's points are being uh, taken on board, uh, are being addressed, and are being given the most earnest consideration uh, by the authorities. Um, Mr Jackson would probably not have been any, of any assistance in any event because his role and his responsibility is in relation to the translation of matters. It's not uh, in relation to these sorts of matters. However, Mr O'Brien, who will give evidence before Your Honour, uh, is able to assist Your Honour in regard to the, some of the matters Your Honour has raised. And I can assure Your Honour that to the extent to which Mr O'Brien is unable to assist Your Honour, we will do everything that we can to ensure that the Commission is given the assistance that is required uh, from us and to help the Commission. The assumption I make at the moment if, is that if there is to be change, it's change that has to be ultimately sanctioned, if not directed by New York. Am I right? Um, Your Honour, uh, ultimately it's a matter for submission. We understand Your Honour's points and we understand Your Honour's particular concern about the environment in which these matters are reported. So that's not been lost upon us at all. The question, I think, at the end of the day is the adaptability of the present structure uh, to uh, these individual circumstances of any particular person and whether that present structure is inappropriate so that it must be done away with or whether the appropriate structure can be modelled uh, for the purposes of an individual person's case. And that's really, I think, the, the, probably one of the most difficult questions that the Commission will have to deal with at the end of the day. It is, but if there is to be change, uh, again, I'd assumed, that change has to be either directed or sanctioned in New York. Well, Your Honour, the, um, it, it may be the case. It depends upon what, is, what, what, what change is contemplated. My, my instructions are, my understanding is, that the local branch has significant flexibility in adapting the uh, Judicial Committee procedure to the individual case. As Your Honour, I think, has heard and will hear, uh, this, the Elders' Handbook is uh, for Elders worldwide, uh, but the autonomy of the branches enables the branches to tailor these matters for individual cases. And that's part of what Mr Sphinx's evidence is about today, so that it may be that well, I'm still at a loss, <laughs> uh, because, as I understand it, the uh, ultimate framework comes from New York. No, Your Honour, the, the ultimate framework comes from the Scriptures, in, well, in the well, sense... Well, all right, yeah. but that, as interpreted by New York. Uh, as, perhaps, as interpreted, but, but also, we would say, as set down in the Scriptures, so that um, that may... Uh, the structure may not be changeable, but well, you see, that's a serious issue. Uh, and if, if the way the scriptures are being interpreted and applied is creating additional trauma for people who are sexually abused by members of the church, that's a serious problem. Understood, Your Honour. I, I think that, again, ultimately it's a matter for submissions. I think our, our submission at the end of the day will be that the structure itself doesn't create or, or exacerbate a trauma, the trauma that has been suffered. What is required is for the structure to be adapted to the individual person so as to, prov to ensure... Well, that may be your submission, but I should put you on notice that that's not a submission which, at the moment, I think is going to deal with the problem we have. Uh, understood, Your Honour. And, and that's why, perhaps at the end of all of the witnesses that are to come, uh, the, if I can put it this way, that Your Honour's concerns uh, will be um, hopefully addressed, but certainly... To the extent to which they're not, I can assure Your Honour that the Jehovah's Witnesses will cooperate uh, in addressing such matters. I mean, let me, I suppose, illustrate it in, in, in a direct way. Yes, Your Honour. We've now 
conducted more than 3,800 private sessions as part of the Royal Commission's work. Yes, right. Yes. Which are people who have uh, been abused coming and telling us their story with the expectation that their story will be accepted. We have a variety of requests from people as to the um, person, commissioner person, who actually receives their story. And there are some who will say, I only want to talk to a woman. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, there are others who will say, I only want to talk to a man. Yes, sir. Um, and um, one needs to be able to say, if you're in the process of receiving these sorts of allegations, one needs to be able to say, that we can meet a request like that in order not to impose trauma on the person when they come to tell their story. Understood, Your Honour. I mean, Your Honour, the, 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 the very point Your Honour makes is, to a certain extent, covered in um, the Elder's Handbook, to a certain extent. I don't say completely, but to a certain extent in paragraph 24 of the Elder's Handbook, where a sister within the faith may go to another sister within the faith to disclose matters. Yes, but that's, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the process, and I think you know I'm talking about the whole process. And there's, there's a second step in this, and that is the, uh, the need to have the uh, survivor confront the abuser. Yes, now, right. all of our learning in the civil courts tells us that that process is likely to create, uh, for some people, extraordinary trauma. Yes, right. um, and we need to look at that process as well. Yes, Your Honour. Your Honour, accepting, um, I'm not, I'm not, I do not for one second cavil with Your Honour, mm. accepting that um, what Your Honour has said, it's our understanding that the more sensitive the response at every step along the way, the less the chance of inflicting or imposing further trauma or exacerbating the situation for the survivor. So that our response is that at every step along the way, it needs to be sensitive to the individual needs of that person, bearing in mind both the, our understanding of secular rights, that is, the right for the, for the individual to report the matter, and at the same time to respect the individual's desire for scriptural counselling or for the matter to be dealt with within the faith. So those considerations need to be balanced in dealing with the matter. That doesn't... Um, that's a, the problem we have because the starting point for the discussion is a, an adherent is required to report. So it's not a question of seeking to have their allegation determined by the church. The obligation, as we understand it, falls upon them to bring that allegation to the church and then the church imposes its structure. This is a discussion that we'll need to have yes, further right. down the track, but I just want to make it plain that these are really significant issues. We had thought that perhaps Mr Jackson might be able to help us with them, but if if he can't... He can't, John. No. Then so be it. Um, now, we had... I've forgotten her name, but the doctor last Friday... Dr Applewhite, Your Honour. And, yes. and you realise where her evidence ended up? Yes, I do, Your Honour, yes. In terms of the church's processes? <laughs> yes, Your Honour. Um, although she came to say that they were good, the ultimate position, as we understand what she said, is they're flawed. Uh, and those flaws are the things that I'm talking to you about now. Yes, I understand, Your Honour. We, we, we do understand, Your Honour. And um, obviously these matters uh, have to be addressed and have to be addressed to assist the Commission. I, I don't wish to take up more of Your Honour's time now and I'm conscious of no. the... the uh, anyway, if Mr Jackson can't help and... Uh, the then, country, then, then there we are. But, 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 but Mr O'Brien will, will be of assistance, Your Honour, and Mr Spinks will be of assistance, Your Honour. Thank you, Honour. Yes. As, as Your Honour pleases. Um, Mr Spinks, I want to address the mechanics a little more of the re responding to reports and allegations process and just understand it. Is it right that the procedure and principles are to be found <clears throat> in the following four documents? Organised to do Jehovah's Will, 2005. Shepherd the Flock of God, 2010, the 1 October 2012 letter, and then the 2013 guidelines for branch office service desks. Uh, those are certainly the, the documents, but the, just the component that's uh, missing from that is that, as the October uh, 1 2012 letter says, 
is that um, the elders contact uh, the branch office, and I think uh, if that's poorly uh, described, which, which it would seem that it is by my uh, statement, I apologise for that. But if I could again just... Just before you carry on, I, for now I'm just trying to seek to identify the documents that we have reference to. Is, is that the corpus of documents, the ones that I've, I've identified? We'll look in a moment what they say with regard to other discretionary factors or so on, but are, are those the documents where we to find the applicable principles and procedure? In addition to the Bible principles and the fact that... If, would I be permitted just to read the one sentence that I was going to refer to, if I could, please? Yes, of course. So that's at um, tab 124. Yes. Uh, Page 131 of the uh, Elders' Handbook. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I thought you were referring to the October 2012 letter. Is it the handbook you're referring to? Yes. To have 120 years, which page? Uh, page 131. Yes, ringtail 132, yes. Paragraph 18, which, as we read, starts with immediately call the branch office, but the last sentence of paragraph 18 says, the branch office will then give direction based on the circumstances involved uh, in each situation. So, yes, those are four current documents uh, based on uh, the scriptures, but that is a pivotal sentence there where the branch office will give direction based on the circumstances involved in each situation. Yes, well, I'll come to that in a moment. As I explained, I'm trying to identify the documents, and then we can then go on to see how the documents are applied and what, disc what discretion there may be for the branch office and so on. But those are the documents, are they? The ones that I identified. Organised, Shepherd, October 2012 letter, 2013 guidelines. Those are the four documents. Are there any other documents you identify and the scriptures you've identified? Any other documents you identify that one should have reference to to find the procedures and principles that are to be applied in responding to reports and allegations of child sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witness Church? I, I apologise for just not saying directly yes to your question, although it's the only four documents, because we've or I have identified that those are the, the current um, uh, documents that have... Uh, in relation to uh, child abuse, but uh, and I think we've made the point that we have published extensively with regard to child abuse. Some of those articles are referenced in the handbook and the letter. Uh, those articles are extensively used by right, right from the 80s, 90s to current. Those articles are used, and specific quotes from those are used, uh, in addition to. Um, uh, the various seminars and, and uh, additional letters. So do those four letters represent the complete direction that is given to elders? The answer is no, but those are relevant documents and, and listed as the current ones that, that uh, primarily deal with, uh, with some of the key issues. Well, those articles and so on you refer to, that's, that's dealing with how parents should deal with child sexual abuse with their children and so on, they're not sources for procedure and principles as to how the organisation responds to allegations of child sexual abuse, are they? Uh, yes, they are. For example, uh, it's in the submission documents, I believe, and, and please forgive me if I misquote, but uh, the... For example, the November 1st, 1995 uh, Watchtower introduced, and it may have been before that, but that's the one in, in my role over the last couple of decades that's stuck in my mind, uh, introduced the, the um, using a letter uh, for the victim or survivor to be able to document the uh, allegation. So... So, to would it be better if all those uh, would it be better if all those quotes were listed one after the other in this book that hundreds of thousands of these books to elders in every culture? I think it probably would be. Uh, so that's just one example of a, a reference. But there are others. 
Well, I understand that may have introduced something that's new, but is it not the case that that then is picked up in one of the four documents to which I referred? Uh, if it is, that's just uh, my memory fails me if that's the case, but if the November 1st, um, 1995 Watchtower uh, is in the, um, uh, those letters, so that's just gone from my memory, sorry, but I, I'm certain it's in the uh, submission documents. Doesn't this present a bit of a difficulty to an elder in a congregation somewhere who's faced with an allegation of child sexual abuse if it's so difficult to determine where this material is on, that's still current on which he can rely? Well, it would be if he didn't ring the branch office. But that's why his first instruction on every occasion is to contact the branch office. And these are the references, remembering uh, with respect that most of these elders we've spoken to, family men, have dealt with one of these issues in their entire decades as, uh, as an elder. Some of them may never um, be confronted with it in their lifetime. So that instruction for elders to ring the branch office where we assist with the myriad of references, uh, I think Dr Applewhite acknowledged that we have flooded um, the website and our publications with references. So what you say is true, that's why they ring the branch office. What about, <coughs> excuse me, a victim of child sexual abuse? Do you accept that to such a person there should be a clear policy and procedure as to how the organisation will respond and how that victim is to raise an allegation? Oh, I think that's a, an extremely valid point and one that in our discussions over the last two weeks from hearing the, the Commissioner's comments that for us to uh, take these references from various places and have them consolidated, consolidated into a, a much clearer format, I absolutely agree. Because you'll accept that the current position is, is uh, a victim wanting to report an allegation would be um, left very uncertain as to how it all works. Uh, would they be able to turn to a document that steps out sequentially what's required? Uh, I would say not. Uh, would they, in referencing on, the, on currently on the JW.org website, and uh, I know there are no absolutes, but I would be surprised if a single Jehovah's Witness in this country uh, is not, does not regularly access the JW.org website, type in... Uh, child abuse, and all the references are there, many of which encourage the benefits of confiding in somebody talking to the elders. But is there a document? Oh, there's not. Well, that's... Probably, you, you just heard the discussion... Oh, sorry, uh, Mr Spinks, you heard the discussion with Mr Topley about this. Yeah. Um, and I understand that what you say, there's lots of references, but inherent in what Mr Topley has said is that an individual would not know what confronts them because, as he puts it, uh, it's necessary to consult and mould a process to the individual case. Yes. So that taking them to documents, but with the expectation that uh, each case will be treated differently, doesn't really help very much, does it? Uh, Your Honour, I respectfully agree that what the Commission has clearly identified is that there's no, shortages of, uh, no shortage of references and, and research material, but does that need to be presented in a, 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 a more user-friendly and, and appropriate... I, I, I totally agree. Well, it's more than that. Um, you understand the concerns that the Commissioner and I have about your current accepted processes, and I stress again, I appreciate that They've been developed with an understanding uh, of the Bible. But do you see the conflict that's emerging between what you are adhering to there and what we have learnt in more recent years about the process of verifying an allegation of sexual abuse? I, I absolutely understand the point you're on. Well, that's the one that needs to be addressed in a really significant way. I mean... Is it, is it appropriate to continue to require um, victims to confront their abuser in order for there to be a determination within the church? Or are you, in fact, 
running the risk of further traumatising people who are already traumatised by their abuse? I, I totally agree, Your Honour. If, if I could, with, with respect, and the, the last thing I want in any way is to appear uh, defensive. That's not my intention. Uh, we've looked in this commission at two situations that, as they have for others, have distressed me to, to hear it through step by step. Uh, are there things that would be done differently uh, today? I, As I watched that, I went back to the branch because I know what I've done, I know what I'm aware of. Uh, have we asked or expected um, a victim to confront their uh, abuser um, without them wanting to do that. Uh, I can't find a record of us having done that. That's the not the point. That's not the point. Um, your whole teaching, of course, requires adherence from your uh, members to your principles. Correct? To Bible principles, yeah, yes. That, that's, that's what's happening. And I don't think you deal with the problem by saying no one resisted um, confronting their abuser. You've heard evidence here about the trauma that it inflicted upon someone who was required to. And if the church has the expectation, and that's the only way the allegation can be dealt with, um, then you've got a problem. It won't be answered by saying no one in our files has said they don't want to uh, so their abuser. That, that won't happen. I apologise for interrupting. I apologise for what I've, uh, my, if I've misrepresented that, uh, Your Honour. But from the mid 1990s, here in Australia, we have used the statement. I went back myself through the case files over the last number of years, and one after the other found where we've directed, and the elders have simply asked the uh, survivor, the victim, to provide in writing their allegation where we have not directed the um, victim to confront their uh, accuser. And I think some of the basis for that uh, misunderstanding is that, one, we've been looking at cases from over 20, uh, 20 years ago, that's true. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, we've, since the mid-1990s, have perhaps not as professionally as others or efficiently as others, but we've recognised that uh, a, a victim or survivor should not have to confront their uh, abuser, and we do that... Well, that needs to be put in your document. Absolutely. It's not there at the moment. Well, uh, with, again, with respect, Your Honour, I, I, that's exactly the question I asked myself, and I said if I had to say to you... Uh, where is that clearly stated? And I found the document, but I, I have a concern about, at this stage of, of the Commission, uh, presenting a, an outline that was presented to all the elders in Australia that should have been in the uh, documents. It's not that says don't get the victim to confront the, the, the abuser. Now, I'm not suggesting that that... I, I, if, if there's a process, if that could be just introduced into the documents for your consideration. Yes, please, if there's any document that's going to help us, we'd like to see it. So, and Your Honour, how that came to be found was through my assistant. We had the note in our previous Elders Handbook from 1991, but none of us had it until we found one of the older members of the department that had actually photocopied and reduced it and stuck it in his book. So I went and found it. It's a, uh, it's called a 337A form, a 337A form, uh, printed May 1998. Well, look, we'd like to see it. Uh, if, um, but I get the impression it hasn't been widely known. Uh, it's part of... We've, have we produced that to elders? No. Oh. They were taught it in 1998, and if it was written in the book here, that would be, that would be very helpful. Well, but I'm happy to produce it. Please, please do. That, that's not the only issue, you know, appreciate that. that we have to confront. Yeah. Well, just in, re in relation to <clears throat> what is printed, you see, the difficulty, it, 
seems to me, with what's published over time and with you not committing to or not being able to commit to just what the corpus of documents is that is the source for these policies and procedures, it's, it's a bit like trying to put your finger on a ball of mercury. Just when you think you've got it, it pops up somewhere else. So just when one thinks one understands what's being said on a particular point, then an article from 1975, Awake, will be produced to say, oh, but look, we also say this. And how is anyone to know just what the position is? Uh, it's a very valid comment, and I can only re repeat again that uh, has the Commission highlighted to us uh, my discussions with our branch committee over the last two weeks. Uh, we, we've looked and said, why, why don't we get these points into a document? We, we see the point, I accept it and acknowledge it. Well, that raises the next point, of course, and that is what uh, th these documents that I've referred to, at least, um, excluding the scriptures that I assume can't be changed, but the four that I've referred to, but also the Awake and Watchtower articles, those all are determined and published from New York, is that right? Correct. What scope do you at the branch office have to publish your own material, which might set it all out nice and clearly? Uh, as long as we don't stray from the scriptures, which is the primary role of the governing body worldwide, if we don't stray from the scriptures, uh, the Australia branch has full authority to... Uh, uh, produce documents to clearly set out for seminars, letters to elders, letters to publishers, what needs to be made clear uh, locally. So the Australia Branch Committee certainly has that authority. And who will be the judge of whether you've, um, whether your document meets that requirement of not transgressing the scriptures? Uh, well, I think... Uh, Anything I'll say is going to appear uh, immodest, Mr Stewart, but I think the one thing Jehovah's Witnesses can do, whether others uh, agree with it, is make application of the, the scriptures to, the way, to our way of life. So if your point is, does that need approval from um, the governing body or from another source, I would say if we, if whatever we do, if it's in harmony with scripture, is a matter that can be dealt with by the local branch office. If you to if you to publish something new which sets out how child sexual abuse allegations are to be dealt with within congregations in Australia, would you need to get the clearance or the go ahead from the governing body that what you've set out is fine because it's not in conflict with the scriptures? I think the documents would show that we correspond openly with the governing body. Um, on matters of interpretation, I think my point is clear that if um, recommendations from this commission and some things that we can obviously see ourselves... So, for example, if there is a legal requirement, whether it's uh, because of uh, mandatory reporting or because of um, a, a criminal law that's less familiar to me than you, but if there are legal implications and we are working outside of those, um, you can be certain that uh, adjustment, an adjustment will be made here uh, in Australia in a document produced relative to Australia, uh, including um, collating those, as you see it, and, and correctly so, um, references from decades that would be better into a single document tailored for the law, the culture, the expectation here in Australia. A absolutely. And you would only do that through... Uh, engagement with the governing body? Uh, I, that's as many things could be done here in Australia. Uh, what I'm saying is we, we have such great respect for the governing body, um, we'd have no issue at all with uh, corresponding um, with them back and forward. Uh, I, I'm confident there'd be no issue if we don't stray from the scriptures that they are happy for each branch committee remembering that those members of the governing body are simply as well unpaid members of the organisation that are selected from elders from different countries. So that's not the issue. The issue is, is it in harmony with the scriptures? And 
uh, is it appropriate here in Australia? And the Australia Branch Committee would have that. Mr Spinks, just on the question of harmony with the Scriptures, is it not the case that over time within the Jehovah's Witness Church there's been uh, a development or change in understanding of certain Scriptures? Uh, yes. So it's not the case then that the Scriptures are clearly have the same meaning to everyone. It may be that m meanings and understandings change over time, is that right? I think it's fair to say if we feel that we've got something wrong or have misapplied a, a scripture, we not only adjust it, but we publish it for all the world to see. So that's, uh, that's true. The point is, is if uh, the Australia branch in publishing a new, uh, or consolidating and, and publishing a new procedure regarded themselves to be with an, with, uh, in harmony with the scriptures, uh, it may be that the governing body took a different view. I couldn't say that w wouldn't be the case, but I think the, the point clearly is that whether it's a, a branch committee as experienced as ours uh, here in Australia, some, some of them per perhaps with more years experience than some of the members of the, the governing body, I don't think that would be the issue. But if, if you're saying the need for open communication... Uh, that's exactly, that's, that's there, but the Australia Branch Committee would, would have that responsibility. Well, I'm saying, well, I'm taking one step further. Practically, in effect, you would need the agreement of the governing body to any new process or procedure that you published, wouldn't you? I don't think that's correct. Because, because if they disagreed, it would mean that you were not in harmony with the scriptures. I think it's, it's, it's such a hypothetical, Mr Stewart, that... If we did something that's in harmony with Scripture, for example, uh, if, if mandatory reporting was required here in Australia, we don't need the approval of the governing body because the Scriptures give us the approval to comply. So uh, I, I would say with respect, the only communication other than the fact that we've got great respect and would communicate openly from the governing body would be if we had clearly misapplied the Scriptures somewhere. Well, let's take a different hypothetical. If you're in Australia through your considerable experience and learning uh, came to the view that there'd been a misunderstanding of the scripture that requires a two, uh, that applies and requires the two witness rule. And your conclusion was that it did not. And you, before you could make that part of your process, you would have to get the go ahead of the governing body, wouldn't you? I don't think anyone of Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia is ever going to write to the governing body and suggest that we've un uh, misunderstood Jesus Christ's clearly recorded words in the Gospel, but it's, it's a difficult hypothetical because uh, no one's going to write that letter. I'm just understanding what in harmony with the Scriptures means. I, I take it that the four documents I've referred to which set out the procedure... Um, those are in harmony with the scriptures. I think we've done our best. If there's something that's not, please, if you brought it to our attention or any one of Jehovah's Witnesses did, we're, we're happy to look at it. But our understanding is that the material we prepare, we do our best to make it in harmony with the scriptures. And in some respects, it, it sets out what the scriptural requirements are, such as, for example, the two witness rule. Uh, they're referred to in the letters, yes. And there are many other aspects where the scriptural requirement is actually identified and referenced, not so. Oh, I think you can see that right through our documents. So is it the case that, as I would understand it, that the governing body, at least I withdraw that, that the Australia branch would not be able to adopt and publish a new procedure that was not in harmony with the four documents that I've mentioned? Uh, I'm just trying to get my head around the hypothetical, but if there was something in the 2012 letter, for example, that was not applicable uh, in Australia, that letter, uh, while the spiritual concepts and essence of it have come from the governing body, that letter is produced in Australia... Uh, and uh, if there was something that was not applicable in Australia, this, the Australia Branch Committee is obligated to, uh, to adjust it. Well, the letter's produced in Australia, but it's done on the, on the basis of almost word for word what was produced to you 
from the governing body in the United States. Not and so. that's because that letter is based on scriptural principles. So I didn't, I certainly personally didn't see anything in that letter that needs adjusting for Australia. Well, let's take something, for example, that's, that's presumably, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, not based on scriptural principle. In um, tab 120, that's the shepherd, the flock, at page 131, which is what you were looking at previously, paragraph 18, it says, in case of child abuse, you, that's the elder, should immediately call the branch office for direction. So now that's a very clear um, direction. If in Australia you took the view that that's not the best way and that the elder should immediately do something else and only thereafter call the branch office, would you be free to adopt and publish a procedure which differed with that direction? Mr. Stewart, it's a pretty vague hypothetical because, uh, but I'll follow your example. I, I would struggle to understand why, as for all the reasons that you've spent a week demonstrating, when a, when a congregation elder perhaps once in his life has to deal with a, an allegation of child abuse, why we would use an example, as would we change that in Australia? Like, the clear... That's going to be applicable around the country, if, if I can. This, as I said, hundreds of thousands, there are hundreds of thousands of elders that have this publication in the highlands of New Guinea, in Eastern Europe, Asia, whatever. There are things that are specific to the country, sensitivities, cultural issues, legal implications. For an elder that once in his lifetime deals with an allegation of child abuse, we're always going to say why don't you ring the branch office? But I appreciate you using it as an example, and if there was an applicable example, um, we, we would have the authority to adjust that for Australia. Well, that's the point I'm getting at, Mr Spinks, because by saying my hypothetical is unrealistic doesn't answer the question. You understand that the substance of the question is to try and determine what is the bound, or what are the bounds of... Uh, the Australia branch's authority to determine something different from what is set out in these documents that have come down from New York. That, that's what I'm trying to understand from you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I apologise if I misunderstood that in any way. Uh, but I can only restate again that the Australia branch does have that uh, authority. So, for example, in the United States, they have a much stronger... Um, ecclesiastical privilege, or lawyer-client privilege, perhaps even than we do here in um, here in Australia. So, sorry, just to clarify, that's in the law you're talking about. Yes, I'm not talking in about the in the law. Yes. No, no, in the law. Yes. So, by its very nature, that means that the Australia Branch Committee is responsible for ensuring that the scriptural policies are followed in harmony with Australian law. Now, in the United States, there are all different mandatory reporting requirements. That branch office would have to do the same. There are very few requirements in some of the Eastern European countries or the Pacific Islands, so those branches have to do their best. Well, the reason for that is because the scriptures say, as I understand it, that you must obey the law. So if the law requires you to do something different in one country from another, then that's in accordance with the scriptures and you will do it differently, not so. Uh, primarily, certainly that's the case to make sure that... But I'm addressing a different question, which is as to in your wisdom, deciding that something should be done differently, the scope that you have to actually adopt that. So I'll take a different example. In the same document at page 90, so Shepherd the Flock, tab 120, page 90, paragraph 3, this is now within the judicial hearing procedure, and it says... Here are only those witnesses of relevant testimony and so on. And it says observers should not be present for moral support. Mm -hmm. And if in Australia you decided that a person complaining of sexual abuse must or is entitled to have a support person present and therefore an observer, would you have scope to do that? We already do it, Mr Stewart. We already do it. That paragraph, if I can, is not talking, and I think this is where some of the confusion comes in again, that Chapter 7 is a judicial hearing procedure for all manner of 
this is not a child abuse manual and it wasn't intended to be presented that way. This is a shepherding manual that deals from... Yes, we understand that. Okay, so that context is not um, child abuse and, in fact, where it makes direct reference to child abuse, it's generally inserted. That paragraph is talking about a general judicial process and... and, and we understand that. Well, if I could just... Things, sorry, if I could just make... Point, the, yes. Could I just make the point if that paragraph is talking about the accused... It's talking about the accused. It says here only those... I understand that. I understand it talks about the accused, but it would seem to go further. It says in the hearing, observers should not be present. Well, I think I've already made the point that we wouldn't have, uh, in this day and age and for a long time, we would not have a victim or a survivor of child abuse in a judicial hearing. This is talking about the accused. This is talking Mr. about the... Mr Sinks, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I can't see how this paragraph's talking about the accused talking about witnesses who have relevant testimony regarding the alleged wrongdoing. Now, that's people who are bringing evidence against the accused. Yeah. How is it a paragraph about the accused? I apologise, Your Honour. The, the middle sentence it talks... I appreciate it's about witnesses. It says those who intend um, to testify only about the character of the accused is, is our point. I, I appreciate, again... That's, char that's character evidence, mm -hmm. and um, that might be good or bad for the accused, but that's the second sentence. And then uh, the third sentence is a general statement about witnesses not hearing the details of the testimony of other witnesses. That's a general proposition. Mm -hmm. And then observers should not be present for moral support. How, how is this a statement directed to the accused? Uh, I apologise again, Your Honour, if that sentence is poorly written and I can see... It's not the sentence, the whole paragraph um, is, it, is talking about witnesses um, to the wrongdoing. And, and again, Your Honour, we would not expect a, a victim or survivor of child abuse to be in the judicial setting in this day and age. Did that happen in those incidents 24, 25 years ago? Yes. Uh, is that um, clearly set out other than in the uh, uh, document that we've asked to tender, the 1995 Watchtower? Could this paragraph be better written to say this is all about the accused? I, I agree totally. The, our application of it in practice in the service department uh, has always been for the accused who's trying to defend himself against allegations to not have observers there for moral support other than the specific witnesses. We don't want the survivor there as a witness at that judicial hearing. Uh, Mr Spinks, the, the document itself, you understand, is very confusing. I do. Least. I do. Just to go back to something you said, um, since this particular document is, is I'm looking at um, the reverse of the title page at uh, Ringtail 0004. Uh, it's published in 2010 by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, published in New York. And this particular one that I have before me is a 2012 printing of it. Um, and this is this applies or was issued to elders throughout the world, is that right? Correct. Yes. So it's not, <coughs> this document doesn't, this document or its equivalent does not change from country to country. Uh, it's in multiple languages, but it would be the basically same. the same. Uniform, yes. yes. And I noticed you use the word lands rather than countries. Um, can you explain that? <laughs> I should know my geography better. How many lands are there in the world, Mr. Steele? Oh, how many countries? Uh... I'm not. <laughs> I've got an idea. Answer your questions, particularly such <laughs> difficult ones. I apologise. You've asked me the question. I'm not certain how many countries there are in the uh, the world and how many lands, but it, it's simply. Um, yeah, I can't answer the question. But what is a land? What is a land? When you say there are uh, Jehovah's Witness congregations in X number of lands, or what do you mean? Do you not mean countries? Uh, it would include Ireland.
Islands. So I think that's probably a, it's probably not a significant point, but there would be 239 different islands or countries. I, I didn't write it. I'm not certain what it means. So you don't know why the language of lands is adopted by the Jehovah's Witnesses rather than countries? Uh, well, I don't think we refer... We use islands, so whether there's some... Indonesia, for example. Is Indonesia one land or however many it is? A thousand lands, how many islands? No, you've got me, got me, Mr Stewart. I, I couldn't explain. I don't know the reason. All right, that was just by the way. Um, can we look at um, paragraph 35 of your statement? You say that the two elders, so this is now dealing with the investigation stage, as I understand it, responding to reports and allegations. The two elders, with the consent of the parent guardian, guardian would talk to the victim with the parent guardian present. Now, firstly, is it necessary that two elders undertake this role? No, but I think what we've presented there is what would normally happen, but... Uh, the um, could there be a situation? I reread that 1998 document and it said one of the elders and a parent or a witness. So well, generally two elders investigate matters, but could it be the mother, uh, a sister in the congregation, a close friend and one of the elders? Yes. So the, the generic advice and direction is that two elders must investigate, but you're saying that needn't be followed. Um, absolutely. Mr Spinks, one of the concerns that's been expressed to us, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is that, and I assume this is true of most of your churches, the elder is likely to be known or, or know well the, an alleged abuser if it's a male. That's true. How do you think it is for a young person having to go to talk about intimate details of their abuse to a person who they know is a person well known to the abuser? Uh, extremely <clears throat> challenging. Uh, perhaps, um, I, I just want to take your point on board, Your Honour, perhaps lessened a little by uh, the fact that these same elders um, we're not talking about in a, uh, a, a church confessional with robes or whatever. We're also talking about men that are, have been their family friends to the, the young ones. They've had meals in each other's homes. And so the, the challenge is also, in other ways, uh, 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 facilitates um, that level of friendship and trust that exists. But I, I acknowledge the challenge that you're raising, certainly. What do we do about it? I think the point that we've made, and I'm not suggesting that I've got answers to these deep questions that the Commission is, is raising, but I think one of the points that we've made, that whether it's a, a male or a female or a male and female together, a man and a woman together, um, at that stage, uh, whoever it is uh, needs to have the, the genuine concern of the victim to be kindly, sensitive, um, compassionate. That same would apply whether that's a, a, a man or a woman, but... That's undoubtedly true of anyone in this role, but that's not addressing the issue. The issue is that the person who is being asked to accept and believe the allegation is known to be a close or good friend of the alleged abuser. And that's, as we discussed inherent in the process, isn't it? Uh, yes, Your Honour, and I, I imagine that's going to be the same in any um, uh, community where the individuals, in a faith-based organisation, where the individuals uh, know and care for one another. That's, that's a challenge that I understand that you're raising. Well, I'm not sure it's in all, but uh, by any means. But, again, I stress, your adherents are required to bring their allegations to the church, aren't they? Uh, in, in a broad sense, I'm happy to say yes, because we know that's the case. Uh, I think the one thing that has got 
lost a little in some of the assertions that have been made is that uh, I don't see published anywhere, and I, I know to be the case, that we don't demand or scripturally enforce a victim of rape, um, a victim of child abuse. It's actually a misapplication. There's been a few scriptures misapplied, but that's a clear misapplication of Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 1, as, as, a, as an open reading of it would show. But um, we've, we don't require um, a victim to come forward if they choose not to. And that's why we have, in some cases, helping um, victims who are not yet ready to reveal who the perpetrator is. Yes. Does it have to be an elder who undertakes the investigation? Or let me put that differently. Does it have to be an elder to whom an allegation of child sexual abuse is made? In other words, you've said it might be an elder with someone else, perhaps a sister from the congregation or, what, or whomever. But, but does it have to be an elder at all? I think, if again, if you, if you reread the case studies, you'll find numerous examples of where the parents or guardians have provided the statement without intervention from the elders. So the, the clear answer to that is, uh, no, that doesn't have to... Well, they've provided it to the elder. So if you're saying then at some point, are the elders involved in the investigation process, the answer is yes. Why, why is it necessary to have elders from that particular church carry out this function I as think... opposed to going outside to people who aren't known? I think it's a very, uh, I think it's a, an excellent suggestion and one that's been discussed um, uh, at length by us over the last couple of weeks when that's been raised and I think we've taken one step towards it. We've got a lot of other steps to take as you've highlighted but one step is to have, at, at least when it gets to the judicial stage, to make sure that that has outside uh, involvement but I think again it's a very good point Your Honour. Is there any possibility of um, having women join in the decision-making process? Uh, scripturally, I pre appreciate that's the pivotal question, and that comes to the question of uh, is it likely that um, women will uh, take on the role of uh, elders in the congregation, and uh, scripturally that's not the arrangement? Your answer to my question is there's no possibility of women being involved in the decision-making process. Is that right? I'm uh, happy to say a clear yes that uh, will Jehovah's Witnesses find a way to uh, adjust the, the scriptural process uh, of uh, the elders being men in the congregation? And my answer, and my answer to that is no. You understand the Bible, I assume, in its social and political context when it was written. I do. And social and political contexts change over time, don't they? They do. Does the approach of Jehovah's to the application of the Bible as a consequence change as society changes? Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I, uh, we, we won't change what is a clear um, uh, scriptural arrangement. So uh, uh, are there things that we would all do, uh, that we do differently now that are, are based on uh, Bible principles? I think Your Honour has highlighted a very clear one in that do Jehovah's Witnesses apply the, uh, the Mosaic law from an ancient civilization that dealt with the, the theocratic, the civil and the, and the criminal all as one code? No, we don't, because as Mr. DeRoy said, um, Christ ended the, the law clear distinction between theocratic and, and, and the law. So um, there have things changed over time? Yes, well, some of those clear instructions in the Scriptures change from the Christian era. I don't believe they will for Jehovah's Witnesses um, because of the application of the arrangements um, uh, in the Bible. And so I've I reasoned through this um, myself, Your Honour, that... Will Jehovah's Witnesses adjust what we see as clear instructions in the Scriptures? Will 
Muslim people change what they believe in the Quran? Will Aboriginal people change what they believe is in their culture? I, I think there are just some things that are so deeply a part of uh, their faith and belief system that what we need to do is make sure that we conform with the law, that we do our best to harmonise with the, the, the culture. But do some of those things fit neatly into 21st century, uh, first century Australia? I, I understand the, the point that you're making. And I take it that if it was the case that there was a conflict between what science might tell us about human behaviour and the way these things should be dealt with and your understanding of the Bible, then the Bible would still prevail. All scripture is inspired of God. We, like many Christians, we're not fanatically um, trying to find references to make life difficult. We are applying scripture uh, as we read it in the, in the best way we can to, to sensitively integrate with, with uh, modern society. But you understand the point. There, there may well be, and we're in one such area where science has taught us a lot in recent years about sexual abuse and how to appropriately respond to it. But if that science was in conflict with your understanding of the Bible, then the Bible would prevail. Is that... uh, abs absolutely, the Bible will prevail. And if I could, Your Honour, that's why hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses are in prison in South Korea, in Taganrog, Russia, Azerbaijan, Eritrea, because they won't budge on a clear Bible um, principle that will endure forever. So if the law of the country was to prescribe a, ma a mode of behaviour which was in conflict with your understanding of the Bible, what would happen then? Uh, we would um, uh, apply the words in the the book of Acts 5.29, to obey God as ruler rather than men, and as we did here during the Second World War, as thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses did when they refused to um, come under the Nazi regime, the fact that the government at the time makes a, a law, Jehovah's Witnesses will always uh, obey Scripture, and that's why, that's why we have 20, 28 uh, successful outcomes in the European Court of Human Rights, because we won't budge where there's a clear Bible principle that happens to be in conflict with uh, the government uh, of the day. We might take lunch. Um, Your Honour, with your leave, just before we do, I might ask Mr Spinks to think about something at lunch because he may be able to help us after lunch, and that's this. Um, Mr Spinks, taking this procedure and the principles that govern the procedure, what I'd like to ask you to identify is what elements of it are based on the scriptures such that they could not be changed. So one that springs to mind is the two witness rule, for example. Maybe I'm mistaken on that. You can explain to me later. But um, what elements are there that are required by the scriptures so that we understand the constraints within which you work in developing a proper system? Let's go take lunch.